There are some vested interests in making sure that, that you're not really confident about your innate or your inner genetic ability to express health and happiness. But I can promise you that your, that your genetic purpose, you know, if you, I, I don't want to get too deep into the purpose of, of, of you know, existence or, or anything, but, you know, some people would argue, um, you know, in the selfish gene, you know, um, it might be argued that we're just simply just, it's DNA that has this selfishness to express itself. Some people would say we're just houses for bacteria, that if you actually look at the bacteria that are in your gut, by the way, you have 10 times more bacterial cells in your gut than you have cells in your entire body. And those cells, are, those bacteria that live in your gut are exactly the same, well, not exactly, but they're, they're the same species that first became you know, single cellular life on this planet. And so some people argue that we're just houses for bacteria, that bacteria have just developed this sort of, this body to carry them around and spread them around. I, I, I don't know what's right, but I do know this. I do know that genetically, 90, over 98% of the population is absolutely capable of expressing full health throughout their entire lives. There are some genetic illnesses, Down syndrome is one, cystic fibrosis is another, but those represent less than 2% of the sickness that occurs in our society, or worldwide. So, um, I, I think maybe the, the purpose to, of tonight might even just be to make you understand how great you are, and how, and, and you know, you're just gonna be on a scale of how much of your inner greatness you're expressing at any given moment. But the truth is, you know, genes really only determine our physical characteristics. In other words, we're not all gonna look the same, uh, some will be tall, some will be short, some will look... I mean, if you were in the perfect physical condition, you had the perfect diet, you had a perfect community around you of people who made you feel safe and loved and important, you had wonderful, perfect relationships, you had a perfect relationship with yourself, you had high self-esteem, you really admired yourself and admired the contribution that you make to your social group, you wouldn't all look the same. You would still have different eye color, different height, you'd have different body shapes within reason. But here's what would never happen. None of us, if we lived that way, would be incapable of, of expressing health throughout our whole lives. None of us wouldn't be good enough. So all these arguments that we have about genetic differences, they're totally irrelevant because those genetic differences might allow you to, you know, to run one-tenth of a second faster, but the genetic difference, no one's genetically weak to the point where they can't live a long, healthy, fulfilled, happy life. You just might not be quite as fast as the person beside you, or you might be a little bit stronger than the person beside you, but we're all good enough. Everybody get that? So back to outliers. What he did was he, was he said, look, everybody thinks there's this myth that, that professional athletes just have this genetic advantage. And so what he did was he, he, he started looking at, at first he looked at hockey players actually. And what he found out was that over 70% of all the players in the NHL were born in January, February, or March. And he thought, that doesn't make any sense. Why would that be? And then he realized that the cutoff date was December for the age group that you played with. So in other words, if you were born in this, on December 31st and somebody else was born on January 1st, they were a full year older than you even though they competed against you. Everybody see what I mean? So here's what they found out, is that early on is in hockey, for example, or in any physical sport, early on in your life, those gaps in, in three to four to six to eight months are, are really big gaps in terms of the development of the nervous system and your ability to coordinate and have agility and strength and power. And so what happens was is that these kids got picked out at an early age as being better. So what happens is, is that if you're born in January, February, March, you have a real distinct advantage over the other kids. So here's what happens. You get, pecked, you get picked for the rep team. And after you get picked for the rep team, what happens? You get better coaching. You're also told, by the way, what? that you're gifted, that you're special. You get better ice time, so your parents actually don't have to get up at four in the morning, so they don't quit. You know, they don't pull you out of, out of hockey, put you in soccer, that's at a decent hour, like I would do with my kids. <laughs> so it becomes this self-perpetuating sort of myth, doesn't it? And so the argument wasn't that, well, we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, you know, that we should take anything away from people born in January, February, March. The argument was, how many Beatles have we missed? How many Bill Gates have we missed? You know, how many, how many Wayne Gretzky's have we missed because we didn't develop them? Because they weren't born in January, February, March, and they didn't excel till later on in their life. You know, I'm married to Lori, to, to Lori Bowden, Lori Chestnut now, and everyone, I, one of the things that always makes me laugh is people say, oh, she's just a genetic freak, she's so gifted. 
you know, and I go, yeah, I know. She's so lucky, you know, that 20 years of getting up at five in the morning and exercising for five hours a day, finishing last or first race and never giving up and keep going, you know, for 10 years until she won a race. That's so lucky. Do you know what I mean? It's just genetic freak. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it's so funny. And so if you, if you look at, at, at this stuff, and, and if you look at, they looked at, he also looked at people like, uh, you know, say the wealthiest people in the world. And, and I, I get it, wealth, wealth isn't everything, but he just looked at all different aspects. So he looked basically from Cleopatra right up to modern time with Bill Gates. And what he found out was that it seemed like the richest people in the world, they, were, they came in clusters, like they were born within a couple of years of each other. And they had no genetic, I mean, they weren't genetic, they weren't twins or anything else. So it's like, they, they had no, they had nothing in common. In other words, they didn't, some came from rich parents, some came from poor parents. Some, you know, got rich in railroads, some got rich in oil, whatever it was. But what he found out was really interesting was there was these two groups of really super wealthy people and they came from America. And one was what, like the Vanderbilts and the Rockefellers. And why, how did they get so rich? There's a few others, but these are the names I remember. How did they get so rich? Well, they just, Rockefeller just happened to be in oil when the American Industrial Revolution took off. Vanderbilt just happened to be an expert in trains when what? The American Industrial Revolution took off. Bill Gates, who's the guy who owns Suncor? I forget his name, anybody know? Anyway, these dudes, what happened? They were experts, they just happened to be experts in computer programming when? When the computer age took off. But what's interesting is that they already have what they call 10,000 hours in. And what that means is that if you want to be good at anything, you have to have your 10,000 hours in. And I always found this interesting because I was telling my brother about this book, and my brother's really into karate or jujitsu. I don't know what the hell it is. But anyway, he goes over to Japan, and these old, crinkly old men come and beat the hell out of him, and he's really, they're 80 years old, and he just kind of like jujitsu him around, and he and my brother comes back and says, you, you just can't believe these guys. So anyway, I was telling my brother the story, and I was saying, you know, it's about 50,000 hours. And my brother said to me, you know, that's really amazing because at the dojo or whatever, you know what I mean? The mojo, they, um, they say if you haven't done a movement 50,000 times, you can't be an expert in it. And as you, it's funny as you go through literature, and I'm really into neurology. That was my specialization when I did my master's degree. And I just, I love neurology because neurology really, neurology is really teaches us why we are who we are. It teaches us why we like what we like. It, you, know, what, you know, what colors you like, what kind of people you want to hang around with, what things you're interested in doing. All that's neurology. All that is is that that's your nervous system as a sponge sponging up your environment. And depending on, you know, what mood you were in when you got exposed to something, who you were around, what music was playing. I mean, there's all kinds of interesting things that anchor us to pleasure and to things that we dislike. But the reality is the nervous system is really interesting to me. But the nervous system requires that amount of repetition for you to become an expert in anything. So if you want to be an expert in anything, don't look to your parents unless they're role models for how to put your head down and work your guts out for, for 50,000 hours. And so there's all kinds of neat stuff. They've done studies on identical twins. They've done studies, you know, so they've done a really interesting study in, um, in the Scandinavian countries. They have an incredible genetic record of their citizenry, like m different than anywhere else in the world. So if you're into kind of gen research in between what's more important, genetics or environment, well, first of all, that debate's over, it's environment, but anyway, um, if you're really into that research, if you go look at studies of what? Twins. In other words, they have the exact same DNA. They have, the, they're literally like identical. Identical twins are genetically identical. So they did a really interesting study on cancer. And they looked and they said, what's the predictive fa uh, factor of whether or not you will get cancer and what type of cancer you will get based on the fact that you have identical genes? What do you think the predictive value of having identical genes was? Almost zero. Almost zero. What was really interesting though is they also did a study on adopted kids. They looked at adopted kids and they found out that if you were an adopted child, meaning that you have no inherited DNA from, from your parents that you're li residing with, and if, you, if your adoptive parents get cancer before the age of 50, you have a 500% greater chance of getting cancer yourself. Interesting, I can keep going. I mean, it's just so amazing. Like, just trust me, it's not your genes. Your genes are just fine.
really. And you know what's really interesting? The really sad thing for me about, this, about the central dogma of genes, which is such a lie, such a mistake, it's an error, is that the people who do have a genetic problem, if you do have a child with Down syndrome, it's almost like they give up on those kids, like their diet doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how much they exercise or how much you stimulate their brain or do any of the other things. And the plasticity amongst people who have genetic illnesses, I'm just going to use Down, Down syndrome for a for an example, if you take a Down syndrome kid and let that kid eat you know, dunk junk food and, and pop and crap and they don't exercise regularly and you don't stimulate them, what happens, and you take another kid with Down syndrome and you get them exercising all the time and horseback riding and you're making sure that they're getting lots of proprioceptive input into their brain, meaning movement, neurology into their brain, and you feed them healthy foods and you're giving them, you're loving them up every day and you're making, giving them chances for success and self-esteem. Do you think there would be a difference after 20 years between those two kids with Down syndrome? To the point where, honestly, if you look at the research, you can almost barely tell they have, you know that Down syndrome face, right? You can, it's almost, it's incredible. So this idea that we think that, that we have this predetermined destiny from birth about whether or not we're gonna get cancer or heart disease, you know, or diabetes or, or, you know, acid reflux or infertility or whatever, depression or anxiety. The idea that you think that you have a predetermined life at birth is shocking to me. And it's the most disempowering belief system you could ever have. 